There, I said it. I confessed to everything before the Inquisition could even begin. Already confused? It's in the title. The Earth is a Womb. From here on out, you'll have to slap me silly just to shut me up. Despite that testimony you gave in the Baptist Church, probably a hundred times and to everyone you knew, you are in fact not born again. Not yet, at any rate. The same sentiment can most certainly be applied to charismatics. What, don't like that fact? Go ahead, come at me, bro. The earth is a womb. You're about to find out why. In the sentences to follow, you will read or hear about such matters as the conscious cosmology, but also pre-existence. Now, there are mostly no surprises. This will make a lot more sense if you can visualize two wombs which the everyday sort needs to inhabit at one time or another. The first was your mother. And here you are. You're out. Congratulations. But there is yet another. And you're still in it. The word matrix apparently originates from the late 14th century or whatever. Its definition reads, an environment or material in which something develops, a surrounding medium or structure, such as the womb or uterus. You should already easily see how we can apply the same word, the matrix, to the very world we currently live in. But we shall forthwith see it applied in the King James Bible. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that Yahuwah slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast, Therefore, I sacrifice to Yahuwah all that openeth the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. Exodus 13.15 Settled, the womb of our mother was a matrix. I'm satisfied. Hava, of course, was the first mother of all human ruach, as her name implies. But from here on out, we will be dealing almost exclusively with the second matrix. You will have to try your hardest to not confuse Yahuwah's cosmology with the human construct, as depicted in the movie The Matrix, and which is based upon a thousand lies too many. Our slave masters have completely inverted reality. Are you ready? Hopefully, ready as you'll ever be. While in Utero, developing babies need oxygen to breathe, but they won't take their first Ruach until after leaving the womb. What this means is, babies don't truly breathe in the matrix of their mother. It is the umbilical cord which provides the unborn baby with oxygen, just not their own. This is due to the fact that unborn babies live in water. When my second twin born was son, he left the matrix of his mother looking rather purple. Not good. I caught him between her knees and then immediately proceeded to breathe the ruach into his mouth. Several years later, He's doing good. Still breathing. Thanks for asking. Now, consider the words of Yahusha when he spoke with Nicodemus in the night. This is a popular passage, one which you are likely intimately aware of. Let's take what we just learned and apply it with fresh eyes. Yeshua answered and said to him, Truth I say to you, no man will reach to see the kingdom of heaven except he become born anew. Nicodemus answered him, How is a man able to be born when he is old? Is a man able to return to his mother's belly and come into the world again? Yeshua answered, Truth I say to you, no man will enter into the kingdom of heavens except he who becomes born again of water and of Ruach HaKodesh. That which is born from the flesh is flesh, but that which is born from Ruach is Ruach. Do not be astonished because I say it is necessary that you become born anew. The Ruach blows to the place where it wants, and you hear the sound, but you do not know where it comes or goes. And so is the man who is born from Ruach. The Hebrew Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. From this passage, we can all agree, contextually speaking, that a second birth is strictly accomplished through the Ruach HaKodesh, the first, of course, is water, which has already been explained. Babies are born from water. 
And wouldn't you know it, even the earth was born out of water. The Ruach again. In the opening pages of scripture, we see the Ruach HaKodesh brewing the waters of the darkened cosmology before the light had flickered on, fertilizing the womb of the earth. So many souls were expected. The feminine descriptions of the Ruach will be saved for another time. I say that only to whet your appetite. But again, contextually, a beautiful picture is formed. The Ruach HaKodesh prepares the womb, whereas the actual cosmology is created by the word of Yahuwah, the only begotten Son. The Father then rules over what had been made until he hands that kingdom over to his Son. Father, Mother, Son. Cosmology is a family affair. The Aramaic Targum states, And the earth was vacancy and desolation, solitary of the sons of men, and void of every animal, and darkness was upon the face of the abyss, and the Ruach of mercies from before Yahuwah breathed upon the face of the waters. Genesis 1-2 Targum We witness the Ruach committing the same deed after the flood of Noah. Actually, all three family members can be found here, enacting their respective roles, including the son as an advocate. Once again, the earth is solitary of the sons of men. The Ruach of life has perished in every man and beast, save for those within the ark, and the Ruach HaKodesh is found hovering over the waters. And Yahuwah in his word remembered Noah, and all the animals and the cattle which were with him in the ark, and Yahuwah caused the wind of mercies to pass over the earth, and the waters were dried. Genesis 8.1 Targum Immediately following Adam and Hava's transgression, the earth was cursed. If you happen to read my paper on serpent seed, then you will recall that there were causes and effects to each of Yahuwah's pronouncements. Hava felt pain in childbirth because conception was a part of her rebellion with the serpent. Seems logical, no? And yet, they were not the only created beings to fail at their intended purposes. Already, the light of the moon had been diminished, so that the sun was appointed to be the greater light to rule the day. Because the moon recited against the sun a false report. I'll leave you to read that for yourself in the Targum, specifically Genesis 1.16. Oh, fine. <laughs> How about I just show you? And Yahuwah made two great luminaries, and they were equal in glory twenty and one years, less six hundred and two and seventy parts of an hour. And afterwards, the moon recited against the sun a false report, and she was diminished, and the sun was appointed to be the greater light to rule the day, and the moon to be the inferior light to rule in the night and the stars. Genesis one sixteen Targum what is that false report? We are not told. I only bring it up because, along with direct consequences to action, creation itself is repeatedly documented as a series of conscious spirits, ruachs, all of which are imbued with free will. The creation account in Jubilees begins that way. For on the first day he created the heavens which are above the earth, and the waters and all the ruach which serve before him the angels of the presence and the angels of sanctification, and the angels of the Ruach of fire, and the angels of the Ruach of the winds, and the angels of the Ruach of the clouds, and of darkness, and of snow, and of hail, and of hoarfrost, and the angels of the voices, and of the thunder, and of the lightning, and the angels of the Ruach, of cold, and of heat, and of winter, and of spring, and of autumn, and of summer, and of all the Ruach of his creatures, which are in the heavens, and on the earth. Jubilees 2.2 two. The last sentence is important. It's why I brought the red marker out. We just haven't progressed that far in the conversation yet. So, take a mental note of the fact that all the Ruach of his creatures, which are in the heavens and on the earth, were created on the first day. That's right. The earth is a womb, and the Ruach HaKodesh is the mother of all. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself because on the first day of the week, the Ruach of nature in its various forms were created. Enoch likewise confirms the fact that the moon is a spirit, a Ruach, along with the stars 
and then steps up his game by claiming that the wind, Ruach, is a spirit, Ruach. Then another angel who proceeded with me spoke to me and showed me the first and last secrets in heaven above and in the depths of the earth, in the extremities of heaven and in the foundations of it and in the receptacle of the winds. He showed me how the Ruach were divided, how they were balanced, and how both the springs and the winds were numbered according to the force of the Ruach. He showed me the power of the moon's light, that its power is a just one, as well as the divisions of the stars, according to the respective names. Every division is divided, that the lightning flashes, that its troops immediately obey, and that a cessation takes place during thunder in continuance of its sound. Nor are the thunder and the lightning separated. Neither do both of them move with one ruach, yet they are not separated. For when the lightning lightens, the thunder sounds, and the ruach at a proper period pauses, making an equal division between them. For the receptacle upon which their periods depend is a sand. Each of them at a proper season is restrained with a bridle and turned by the power of the Ruach, which thus propels according to the spacious extent of the earth. The Ruach likewise of the sea is potent and strong, and as a strong power causes it to ebb, so is it driven forwards and scattered against the mountains of the earth. The Ruach of the frost has its angel. In the Ruach of hail there is a good angel. The Ruach of snow ceases in its strength, and a solitary Ruach is in it which ascends from it like a vapor, and is called refrigeration. The Ruach also of mist dwells with them in the receptacle, but it has a receptacle to itself, for its progress is in splendor, in light and in darkness, and in winter and in summer. Its receptacle is bright, and it is an angel. The abode of the Ruach of dew is in the extremities of heaven, in connection with the receptacle of rain and its progress is in winter and in summer. The clouds produced by it, and the clouds of the mist, become united. One gives to the other, and when the Ruach of rain is in motion from its receptacle, angels come, and opening its receptacle, bring it forth. When likewise it is sprinkled over all the earth, it forms a union with every kind of water on the ground, for the waters remain on the ground as nourishment to the earth from El Elyon, who was in heaven. Upon this account, therefore, there is a regulation in the quantity of rain, which the angels receive. These things I saw, all of them, even paradise. Hanok, Enoch, chapter 60, 1 through 14. What have we just read? Much. Lightning and thunder are two separate spirits working together. Likewise, the sea is a ruach, while the frost, hail, and snow are all ruach each according with a good angel. So too is dew a ruach. The angels work with the clouds in order to bring forth rain, and so on and so on. Intense stuff. Does it still perplex you as to why countless generations of the ancients worship trees? If you're prepared to tell me the ancients were not nearly so in touch with reality as our modern contemporaries, then I will remind you of the government agenda to enlarge the pronunciation of everyone's belly buttons while eating pork and binge-watching science. It seems to be working. Getting back to Adam and Hava. Adam was born from the womb of the earth as a shining creature, clothed in light. Afterwards, the ground was cursed, not because of Adam, per se, but because it did not report his deed, cause and effect. Like the moon, so too did the light of Adam diminish. Regarding the earth, we read, But to Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the word of thy wife, and hast eaten of the fruit of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, accursed is the ground, in that it did not show thee thy guilt. In labor shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Genesis 3.17, Targum the earth speaks. You will likely tell me that the earth has never spoken to you. Would it comfort you to know that the earth has never spoken to me either? I have spoken to the trees to no avail. I have also only had one-way conversations with dogs, as the confusion of tongues first affected the animals after Adam and Hava's transgression. 
they once spoke in Hebrew, you know. And on that day was closed the mouths of all beasts, and of cattle, and of birds, and of whatsoever walks, and of whatsoever moves, so that they could no longer speak. For they had all spoken one with another, with one lip, and with one tongue. Jubilees 3.29 A couple of weeks ago, I got into a conversation with a raccoon. He was hunting for snakes or what have you, and I talked to him about Yahuwah, using as many Hebrew words as I could. The raccoon listened with interest. He then followed me home and slept in the grand oak tree outside our upstairs bedroom window for the following week. And wouldn't you know it, there was a time when the earth swallowed people up too. My wife deserves a credit on that one. I was just sitting there one day, watching her lips silently mumble as she read her own copy of the Targum, waiting for something to happen. She is the mother of our twins, in case you were wondering. And then it occurred to her, she exclaimed, I think the earth used to swallow up the dead. Not that the earth would swallow everyone up, mind you. Why only some, while refusing others, is anybody's guess. But she has a point. According to numerous passages in scripture, the earth does swallow. Gulp, the most obvious example, comes to us by way of Korah's rebellion, wherein we read, And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and the men of their houses, and all the men who adhered to Korah, and all their substance. And they went down with all they had alive into Sheol, and the earth closed up upon them, and they perished from the midst of the congregation. Number 16, 31 through 32, Targum. You will tell me that was a one-time affair and intended as a sign that Yahuwah's instructions in righteousness, as given through the word of Yahuwah, are not to be tampered with. If so, then you are correct, but only partially. Moshe did say the death of Korah and his confederacy of rebels would die, a death which hath not been created since the days of the world, insomuch as the mouth for the earth, which hath not been made from the beginning, be created now, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them all they have, and they go down alive into Sheol. In order that everyone remaining understand that they had provoked Yahuwah to anger in denying his word. You see, the sign was that the mouth had not formally been created, as this sort of wrath had not been planned for. Normally, the earth swallows the dead. But here, and only this one time, they were swallowed alive. A careful reader of Genesis will note that Cain is never mentioned as having buried his brother, Habel. You would think he would, but it never says he did. It is the earth which swallowed him. And unlike Adam's transgression, a report was offered. And he, Yahuwah, said, What hast thou done? The voice of the bloods of the murder of thy brother, which are swallowed up in the sod, crieth before me from the earth. Genesis 4.10, Targum. Edit. Correction. Only the blood of Habel was swallowed up in the sod. You see, even I struggle at reading a text properly. The blood did cry out, though. According to the first book of Adam and Eve, the earth thrice vomited Habel. It says thus, Then Cain began at once to dig the earth wherein to lay his brother, for he was trembling from the fear that came upon him, when he saw the earth tremble on his account. He then cast his brother into the pit he made, and covered him with dust. But the earth would not receive him, but it threw him up at once. Again did Cain dig the earth and hid his brother in it. But again did the earth throw him up on itself, until three times did the earth thus throw up on itself the body of Abel. The muddy earth threw him up the first time because he was not the first creation, and it threw him up the second time and would not receive him because he was righteous and good and was killed without a cause. And the earth threw him up the third time and would not receive him, that there might remain before his brother a witness against him. And so did the earth mock Cain until the word of Elohim came to him concerning his brother. First book of Adam and Eve, 79, 11 through 15. Exactly. The earth sounds conscious to me. Kind of hard to tremble on somebody else's behalf, or then turn around and mock that person if they're not even aware of their own existence. Wouldn't you agree? It's certainly what I think. Elsewhere, 
we are given an insider's glimpse into an actual conversation that takes place between the earth and the sea. We have already encountered the Ruach of the Sea in Enoch 60 verse 9. The context here is that Pharaoh's army has pursued Israel into the Red Sea. It doesn't go well for them. The sea spake to the earth, Receive thy children. But the earth spake to the sea, Receive thy murderers. And the sea was not willing to overwhelm them, and the earth was not willing to swallow them up. The earth was afraid to receive them, lest they should be required from her in the day of the great judgment in the world to come, even as the blood of Habel will be required of her. Whereupon thou, O Yahuwah, didst stretch forth thy right hand, and swearing to the earth that in the world to come they should not be required of her. And the earth opened her mouth and consumed them. Exodus 15.12, Targum. Notice how the earth here is spoken about in the feminine. Lest you forget, we are dealing with two wombs, two births, water and spirit. Both feminine? Most definitely. Hava was the mother of every living human soul born of the fleshly matrix, via water. The other womb is, as you will know by now, the earth, by which the righteous soul is intended to await his second birth, via the Ruach HaKodesh. We will define the qualifications of righteousness hereafter, and as part of my conclusion. Every Ruach was created for one purpose, to serve Yahuwah, but also to serve man. No, not cook him up and deliver him on a platter, as that episode of the Twilight Zone suggests. The sun and the moon serve us, just as the snow and the rain serve us. They are also employed for judgment, but that is another matter. The serpent was created to serve us, but he was like to hell with that. I have probably stated this a hundred times already, but Satan's desire is to transform humanity into his own image, rather than Yahusha's. And who opposes his goals? Those who wish to conform to Yahuwah's image by keeping the Father's commands and the testimony of Yahusha. Revelation 14.12 There it is. Righteousness. Which brings up our next example. Strokes of a second and far more epic exodus are painted in Revelation when we see the serpent attempting to devour Yahuwah's elect, rather ironically, by way of water. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Revelation chapter 12, 15 through 16. There is nothing peculiar here, as we have already established how divine spirits make up the elements of the world around us. Even Satan can take on the appearance of water. A similar scene is described when Satan hoped to stop Abraham on his journey of obedience, sacrificing Isaac by transforming himself into a river. That can be found in Jasher 23, 34 through 38, and the writings of Abraham, chapter 141. I can't help but notice the water seemed stubborn, perhaps initially even non-compliant, when it came to Pharaoh's army, but more than willing to devour the set-apart ones. In a stunning intervention, the earth opens her mouth and swallows up the flood water. Before revolution comes to an end, we shall see the earth and the sea offer back everything that it swallowed up once and for all. For one purpose alone have we been brought into this world, and that is to put the soul to the test. Who will love Yahuwah by being obedient to his set-apart ways? After being judged according to his works, who will be born again into eternal life? There is a fascinating conversation that goes down between Ezra and the angel Uriel regarding the birth of the elect, specifically the timing of their arrival in a world filled with rapine. We will turn to that, but first, we need to understand that every soul from every generation was created at the very beginning of creation. It's why I, I had you take a mental note of Jubilees 2-2. On the first day, while the Ruach HaKodesh hovered over the face of the waters, in preparation of all who were to be born, all Ruachoth of his creatures, which are in the heavens and on the earth, were created. Are you a Ruach? Do you have the breath of life? Or do you know anybody who has? Then Jubilees 2.2 is describing that person. A second witness can be found in the following text. Yahuwah is an Elohim of knowledge, 
By his word was everything made which was made, and he governs all things according to his infinite foreknowledge. Even before he created the heavens and the earth, he counseled with the hosts of heaven and planned a plan wherein the spirit of every man should have his appointed role. For the spirit of every man appeared before the Father of spirits in the beginning and received a place appointed in the family of heaven and earth. When a man fills his appointed role, it is according to the glorious design of the Father of spirits, and each one functions according to the divine plan. The work of Elohim is pushed towards its consummation. The Book of the Order of Elijah the Prophet, Chapter 8, Verses 1-4 through four. What this means is, you were not appointed to be a star in the firmament, or the thunder working in unison with lightning. Duh! Here at the Unexpected Cosmology, we only identify according to our biology, as prescribed in the matrix of our mother's womb. For example, somebody is bound to read this, or listen to this, who identifies as an alien or a dog. If this is you, then just know you are a product of the construct, engineered by the intel community. They're pimping you out and using you as a means to depopulate the earth. You will be disposed of. The god vermit will make certain of that. Contrarily, while the Ruach HaKodesh was fertilizing the womb of the world, the Father of Spirits appointed every man his time and place. Aside from being assigned a biological man or woman, what you should be asking yourself is what a man's appointed role is. Again, that question will be answered in my closing argument. Regarding the pre-existence of souls, I've whetted your appetite, haven't I? You want more. I know you do. Well, here's another. Sit down and write all about the souls of men, those of them which are not born, and the places prepared for them forever. For every soul was created eternally before the foundations of the world. The Book of the Secrets of Enoch, 23, 4-5. And now for that conversation between Ezra and Uriel. Read, and then we will discuss. And I said, Yet behold, O Adonai, thou dost have charge of those who are alive at the end. But what will those do who were before us, or we, or those who come after us? He said to me, I shall liken my judgment to a circle. Just as for those who are last, there is no slowness. For those who are first, there is no haste. Then I answered and said, Couldst thou not have created at one time those who have been and those who are and those who will be, that thou mightest show thy judgment the sooner? He replied to me and said, The creation cannot make more haste than the Creator, neither can the world hold at one time those who have been created in it. And I said, How hast thou said to thy servant that thou wilt certainly give life at one time to thy creation? If therefore all creatures will live at one time, and the creation will sustain them, it might even now be able to support all of them present at one time. He said to me, Ask a woman's womb, and say to it, If you bear ten children, why one after another? Request it therefore to produce ten at one time. I said, Of course it cannot, but only each in its own time. He said to me, Even so have I given the womb of the earth, to those who from time to time are sown in it. For as an infant does not bring forth, and a woman who has become old does not bring forth any longer, so have I organized the world which I created. Second Esdras 5, 41-49 There, I said it, and now Ezra has said it. The earth is a womb. Can't claim I'm making it up now, can you? Second Esdras was at one time or another included within the King James Bible. Not that its former inclusion in a Masonic furniture piece holds any weight to my own acceptance of what is and what isn't scripture, but I just thought you should know. Scribes of King Jimmy thought it important, or semi-important. Ezra needed instantaneous relief. He wanted an immediate harvesting of the righteous soul right then and there. And yet Yahuwah had created so many souls before his throne that they could only fill the earth over a multitude of generations. As Uriel said, a human mother cannot produce ten souls at one time. Eight, maybe, but certainly not ten. Satan has labored to handicap that growth by continually demanding human sacrifice, because it's all a numbers game. Cut off one soul, 
as he did when Cain murdered Abel, and you've now exterminated generations of an expected seed. Does Satan's war against the sainthood, even the expected sainthood, prolong the process of redemption in the womb? I don't know. You tell me. Point is, if he could, you know he would. In Second Ezra, the purpose of this womb is also answered, as the earth was created for the sowing of souls, testing obedience, separating the wheat from the chaff, light from darkness, sheep from goats, stars from planets, eventually harvesting the righteous and throwing the fruitless rubble in the fires of Gehenna. The world was created that way from the very beginning, even before Adam and Hava's transgression. Genesis 1.29 in the Targum specifically states that every unfruitful tree was designed for the need of building and for burning. Mm Mm-hmm. Like unfruitful souls. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Sheol delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and Sheol were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Revelation twenty thirteen through 14 The conscious earth obeys Torah. The aim of every soul is to be born again. Well, perhaps not every soul. We're all aware of the God-vermit agenda to babysit humanity. Currently, an entire generation would rather binge-watch reality television while enlarging their billy button with Cheetos. Every mystery religion on earth, however, advertises knowledge of the divine within as the solution for escape which, as my serial reader should have memorized by now, is a ridiculous proposition, since it is only brought to our attention through the slithering tongue of the serpent. Even Christianity, for the most part, advertises a counterfeit tree of life. They will direct you to the tree of knowledge of good and evil when telling you an existence deprived of Torah is a life well spent as Yahuwah's instructions in righteousness have apparently been done away with. Oh, sigh. The lies don't stop, do they? Just say no. Only obedience to the law of Yahuwah, as well as the testimony of Yahusha, who is the Torah made flesh, will assure our second birth in the garden. It's the story of the Bible, people. I saw all the deeds of people which were done in this world under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, and breaking of the Ruach. A man whose ways are rebellious in this world, and who dies in them without repenting, is not permitted to be straightened out after his death. And a man who is lacking in Torah and the commandments during his life, after his death, is not permitted to be counted among the righteous in the Garden of Eden. Ecclesiastes 1, 14-15, Targum Another promise given to us through the writings of Solomon is that we can only carry one thing with us into the grave, and that is Torah. A man who is rich in wisdom has the wisdom of the Torah of Yahuwah. Just as he occupied himself with it in this world and struggled with instruction, so it will rest with him in his tomb and not leave him alone, as a wife does not let her husband sleep alone. Ecclesiastes 5.11, Targum Living a set-apart life on the earth and before the throne is why you were formed in the womb. Both of them.